Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar. It's a pleasure to chair this webinar on ventilation in the heart. It's really important to remember heart-lung interaction in our intensive care patients, in our cardiac ICU patients. I have the pleasure to be here today with uh, Professor Giuseppe Massip from Barcelona and Professor Martin Balik from Prague. So before I hand over to Professor Massip, I just want to make a small introduction about what we're going to touch on today. And we have to remember, first of all, that heart-lung interaction is something that we have in every moment that we live. Even in this very moment that I'm talking, there is heart-lung interaction, which means that the effect of the changes in the intrapleuric pressure are going to have some effects on the heart. And we know that if we measure this, we know that during the inspiration there will be a decrease in the intrapleuric pressure and this will have different effects on the afterload and on the uh, preload. And we will see these things. Uh, for instance, if we measure continuously the pulmonary pressure and the stroke volume of the right ventricle, we see that there are some cyclical changes. Interestingly, and usually often because the effect on the afterload of the right and left ventricle are opposite with the ventilation, we will also see that there are some changes on the left ventricular output, but these are usually on opposite side of the cycle. Ultimately, of course, with the Frank Starling mechanism, the two outputs have to be equal over time. Now, what happens when we ventilate our patient? Well, we are inducing some positive pressure there, and that means that by increasing the pressure in the pleura during the inspiration, we are impeding the venous return, so we will have a decrease in the preload, but we'll also see different effects on the afterload. So we'll see an increase in the afterload of the right ventricle usually, and a decrease in the afterload of the left ventricle. It's not always so simple, because the reason why we ventilate our patient is often because they are hypoxic, and we know that, for instance, the reason is some hypoxic areas in our lungs. There is a very powerful physiological protective mechanism, which is the uh, pulmonary hypoxic vasoconstriction, which means that we will try to prevent for blood flow to go to areas that are not ventilated. But this increases, per se, the afterload of the right ventricle. So by recruiting and by oxygenating better, the, uh, our patient, we are hope also to decrease that uh, component on the afterload. But on the other hand, if we over-distend the alveoli and we work too hard on the pressures, then we can actually create an opposite effect that again may be induce right ventricular failure in our patients. So, what are the learning objectives that we will get in this webinar? Well, we will try to understand really what are the effects of the heart-lung interaction on the preload, on the right ventricular afterload, on the left ventricular afterload. We will try to understand what is the effect of the ventilation on left ventricular failure, and we will try to understand how to keep the lungs recruited without compromising the right ventricle, and also how to interpret indices of fluid responsiveness and what are the pitfalls in our patients when they are into failure. So without losing any more time, it's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Professor Giuseppe Massip from Barcelona, that is going to talk about the effect of mechanical ventilation, the left ventricle, of non-invasive ventilation in acute heart failure, and also what happens when we wing our patients from the ventilator. Professor Massip. Thank you, Dr. Ciccone. Uh, following your explanations, uh, we knew in spontaneous uh, breathing, uh, the contraction of the diaphragm produces a negative pressure into the lung that uh, facilitates the, the air uh, to go uh, into the, the lung. However, when we um, use mechanical ventilation, we are applying a positive pressure and, and we are uh, producing positive pressure into the lung and this changes completely the relationship between the, the cardiovascular and respiratory system. And these positive pressures will produce some effects in the respiratory, uh, uh, like uh, recruitment of collapsed uh, alveolar units, an increase in functional residual capacity, maintenance of continuously operated alveoli, and maintenance of continuous operate, uh, sorry, uh, gas exchange during the whole respiratory cycle and intralveolar pressure against edema. All of these actions will decrease uh, the work of breathing and improve the oxygenation. And also there are some hemodynamic effects, like a decrease in pulmonary shunt. But uh, regarding the, the, the effects uh, of this positive intrathoracic pressure, uh, you can see that there is an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance that uh, uh, produces an increase in right ventricular afterload, 
This may produce a, a dilatation of the right ventricle, uh, pushing the uh, interventricular septum to, to the left and uh, uh, diminishing the size of the left ventricle because there, there is an interventricular inter, uh, interdependence. And this will produce a reduction in the compliance of left ventricle. Also, the, the, this positive uh, interthoracic pressure will reduce the venous return, and this, and this will produce a, a decrease in the preload of the right ventricle and the left ventricle. All of these actions will, uh, may produce a <coughs> systemic hypotension, a reduction in the cardiac output, in the stroke volume, and fluid retention. But in patients with heart failure, uh, all of them have uh, increased uh, left ventricular and after load and preload. And this uh, decrease in left ventricular preload may be beneficial, but also there is a, a, a decrease in the left ventricular after load. Because uh, left ventricular after load is the uh, systolic wall stress, which is the quotient between uh, the, the pressure uh, uh, and, and the radius of the camera, uh, but uh, divided by uh, the wall thickness. And uh, in, in the, the positive uh, interthoracic pressure will act uh, like uh, in increasing the denominator and this, uh, in decreasing wall stress. Um, for this reason, we can see in, in some patients with heart failure an increase in cardiac output when we apply mechanical ventilation. And uh, how we can uh, apply this uh, positive pressure ventilation with uh, two, essentially are two ways, invasively by through uh, um, in, endotra endotracheal intubation or non-invasively, usually with, with a mask. And let's go to uh, uh, the case. This is a 63-year-old male with uh, previous hypertension, diabetes, and previous non stemi and um, the patient called the ambulance for dyspnea and chest discomfort and was diagnosed with acute pulmonary edema. Uh, the, his uh, uh, heart rate was 128, the uh, respiratory rate was 40, and the oxygen saturation was 71, and systolic blood pressure was uh, 135 <laughs> over 80. And let's go to the first question. Uh, in addition to intravenous uh, treatment, which of the following will be the best option for oxygen therapy in this patient with severe acute pulmonary edema? Venturi mask, nasal cannula, non-invasive ventilation with nasal mask, non-invasive ventilation with full face mask, or intubation? Okay, so you can vote and you have another 50 seconds to, to vote. And I think this is a classical scenario of a patient that comes with respiratory failure. We think that the origin is cardiac. What do we do? Clearly, we want to improve the oxygenation there. But the patient, as you see from these numbers, is also tachycardic. He's having some work of breathing there. And I'm very interested to see what are the views of the audience uh, from home in terms of whether we will just give some oxygen some oxygen with some non-invasive ways of delivering or actually going, going for, uh, for an intubation. So we still have another 10, 15 seconds to vote and then we're going to close and we will see what, uh, what have been the answer to this, which is really one, probably one of the most important interventions in, in these kind of patients. So let's see what are the answers to this. Well, we have a prevalence of non-invasive ventilation with full face mask, about 70% of the people answered that. And then 14% of the people said intubation, and the rest of our colleagues from home, there was an equal between non-invasive with nasal mask or a venturi mask. So what, what would you have done? In this case, uh, we would use uh, non-invasive ventilation with full face mask because you know that um, most of these patients uh, have shortness of breath and they are uh, breathing by the mouth and they need a mask that uh, covers mouth and, and nose. And also, uh, as I'm going to show you, that there are some reasons to prefer uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, over intubation of, vent of venturi mask. Do you think that between intubation and venturi mask, one of the two options could be more dangerous in this uh, situation? Uh, usually, uh, in, uh, intubation is invasive. <laughs> the other is non-invasive. You know that there are um, complications for the intubation and also the, the patients need sedation. And uh, Avoid intubation is always a good goal. <clears throat> Okay, uh, regarding non-invasive ventilation, uh, there are several ways to, to, to give non-invasive ventilation. One is CPAP, the other is pressure support ventilation, uh, the other is a high flow nasal cannula and or recently adaptive servo ventilation. Uh, CPAP doesn't need uh, uh, a ventilator, 
and it's very simple to use. But for pressure support, uh, we always need a ventilator. And uh, there are some other modalities of pressure support, but what uh, there have not been tested in, in acute pulmonary edema, but maybe used in other scenarios. High flow nasal cannula is also another option, but uh, it has been uh, proved to be effective in in patients with hypoxemic uh, um, respiratory failure, but if the patient sh uh, have um, Hypercamnia is not uh, the best option, probably. And, uh, and cerebral ventilation is a modality that has been used for uh, sleep disorders, although some, some, there are some studies uh, that have been used in, in, the, in this scenario. Regarding the ventilators, we can use portable ventilators uh, that are specific for non-invasive ventilate, uh, ventilation. Uh, transfer ventilators or ICU ventilators. All of them are uh, equipped with a, a sort of alarms, uh, several modalities, uh, uh, displays, and leakage compensation and flow regulation. And regarding the interfaces, uh, in this case, we are talking about uh, acute pulmonary edema. We, we can use uh, a CPAP mask, in this case, a Vusignac mask, uh, but also we can use oronasal mask or full face mask. Uh, the, the, to cover uh, 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 the nose and the mouth as we commented before. Uh, there were several trials that uh, demonstrated that uh, an, an advantage of non-invasive ventilation over standard oxygen therapy, but in 2008, uh, the 3CPO trial that was a, a, a large uh, trial that was performed in, in UK uh, in the emergency department with, uh, with more than 1,000 uh, patients uh, distributed in three groups, standard therapy, CPAP, uh, uh, pressure support ventilation, and all these patients had a pH uh, lower than 7.35. And this uh, trial failed to demonstrate uh, a, a reduction in mortality uh, in, in, with uh, non-invasive ventilation. It was the aim of the study. However, in the meta-analysis that included this study was uh, performed uh, later, uh, showed that the, both modalities reduced the intubation rate nearly 50%, and also uh, CPAP still uh, uh, reduced uh, the, the, the mortality, but not uh, pressure support, uh, probably because there were less uh, studies. But anyway, the, they found that there was a relation between the, the um, severity of the patients in terms of uh, ischemia or uh, uh, acute coronary syndromes, uh, the, the, the more ischemia or myocardial infarction, the greater the benefit of the reduction in mortality obtained with CPAP. And we know that uh, uh, the non-invasive ventilation uh, in acute pulmonary edema is the second uh, indication for uh, this technique. And also there are several trials that have demonstrated advantages uh, when uh, CPAP is used in the pre-hospital in terms of uh, reducing uh, intubation rate or improving the gas exchange when the patients arrive at the hospital. And this is the algorithm that has been proposed by the European Society of Cardiology, the, uh, the, our group in acute heart failure. Uh, and you see when a patient with acute heart failure uh, has uh, respiratory distress, uh, in the pre-hospital should be treated with CPAP if, if it is available. Some patients probably need to be intubated in, uh, in the, in the pre-hospital, but uh, if you can use CPAP, uh, it's good. Uh, and when the patients arrive at the hospital and you have uh, uh, the analysis, uh, you, you, you have blood gases, uh, you can uh, um, assess the, how is the patient. If there still is respiratory distress with hypercarmia, uh, severe acidosis, probably we, we would uh, prefer the use of pressure support ventilation, but CPAP could be also used. Patients who fail could be intubated, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, in some trials they have used uh, pressure support ventilation as a rescue therapy for CPAP. And this is the, our uh, algorithm uh, that uh, you can see in patients with respiratory distress and acute heart failure, uh, non-invasive ventilation is one of the uh, first line techniques. And the patient arrived at the emergency department and uh, uh, the other uh, analysis <coughs> that we had is uh, elevated troponin T. Uh, glomerular filtration rate was a little bit uh, uh, decreased. Uh, lactate were, were high. Uh, and was acidosis, uh, pH was 7.12, uh, hypoxemia, but the patient was still with uh, uh, CPAP. 
Uh, PaCO2 was 58, and, 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 uh, and uh, metabolic acidosis was quite evident. Systolic blood pressure decreased to 85 over 60. Heart rate was still 138. Uh, FiO2 was 150. Uh, saturation was 91. Respiratory rate was 30. Uh, and the urinary output was uh, lower than 30 milliliters per hour. This is the electrocardiogram. Were, were not clear signs of uh, ST segment elevation, where, 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 where uh, uh, the repolarization was altered uh, diffusely. And this was the uh, X ray film <coughs> with showing pulmonary edema. And this was the echocardiogram showing the uh, severe depression of the left ventricular function. And this is the next uh, question uh, Which of the following is true regarding ventilation in patients with cardiogenic shock? And non-invasive ventilation is contraindicated. Pressure control, continuous mandatory ventilation is preferable to other ventilatory modes. Uh, target tidal volume should be 8 to 10 milliliters, milliliters kilogram. High levels of PIP may not be tolerated in this setting. Or high uh, peak airway pressure is more predictive of bad outcomes than high plateau pressure. Okay, great. So we have another 40 seconds to vote. And again, this is a very challenging scenario, but not something that we're not used to, to see in our intensive cares. And uh, really clearly, the, the question that goes to, to my mind and to our mind when we approach this kind of patient at the bedside is how do I restore some re reasonable levels of oxygen there? Or I can have the the left heart, but really how much can I push and whether if my push can cause any harm. So there is a lot, uh, lot to discuss here. We still have another 10 seconds to go and then we will be able to see what have been the answers of our colleagues from home. So let's have a look. The questions have been answered in this way. So the majority is probably is an equal split before saying that pressure control uh, ventilation is preferable to other ventilatory modes. And the 33% says that actually PEEP may, high PEEP may not be tolerated. And there is an equal split, I would say, between the, between the others. So what is your answer? Uh, there, there is no evidence that uh, one modality of ventilation is superior to other in this scenario. Uh, and we will uh, address uh, other, uh, the other uh, possibilities in, in next slides. <coughs> Uh, for example, in the car shock study, which was a, a, a registry uh, carried out in, in Europe uh, uh, with more than 200 patients, non-invasive ventilation was used in 12% of them. Then uh, the, the, the old uh, uh, sentence that uh, non-invasive ventilation is contraindicated in patients with cardiogenic shock is not true. These patients were successfully ventilated. And in this case, the patient was intubated, uh, and uh, this is very common than patients uh, when are intubated and uh, decrease the sympathetic tone. There is a hypotension also for the sedation. And let's uh, go to a, a, a review of which are the respiratory disorders that we can see in cardiogenic shock. Uh, there is an increase in that space because it, it is a fall in pulmonary perfusion. Uh, it, it is a shunt effect because of pulmonary edema, hypoxemia, the alveoli are, are full of water. Uh, ventilation perfusion inequality, this produces respiratory failure. And also there is tissue hypoperfusion, alternate mental status, like the sidemia, metabolic acidosis, an increase in uh, arteriovenous difference, and a decrease in central venous uh, oil saturation. And also, uh, there is a respiratory muscle dysfunction that this produces hypoventilation and hypercapnia. There is pulmonary inflammation that uh, with the release of cytokines and, and inflammatory response. And also, patients have tachypnea with an increasing work of breathing. Uh, the goals of mechanical ventilation in this uh, setting is uh, establish an adequate airway to reduce the, the oxygen consumption, to improve oxygenation, to reverse respiratory acidosis decrease sympathetic tone, and also improve tissue perfusion and metabolic acidosis. Probably the most important is the, the reduce of the work of breathing that, that is very important in this setting. <clears throat> and when we want to ventilate this patient, don't forget that uh, 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 some, some years uh, we ventilate the patient with a target volume of 
uh, 10 milliliters kilogram. This could over distend the alveoli in inspiration, and uh, without PIP, the, there was a, a, a collapse of the alveoli in, in, in expiration. And now we use always uh, some degree of PIP to avoid this collapse and also uh, low tidal volume to avoid this over distension. Uh, the, the target will be about 6 milliliters per, per kilogram. And the patient. Uh, uh, was performed uh, uh, on a, a coronary angiogram, and you can see in this case <coughs> there was a severe stenosis in left anterior descending artery, and also the the circumflex was uh, totally occluded, and the right uh, the right coronary artery was also chronically uh, occluded. You can see by uh, collaterals. Uh, uh, the right coronary artery. It was a three-vessel disease with a severe mm, left ventricular dysfunction. This patient was in cardiogenic shock. Uh, cardiogenic shock usually has this uh, hemodynamic pattern with a decrease in cardiac output, uh, increase in si and systemic vascular resistance, and high um, capillary wedge pre pressure, although few patients may present a hyperdynamic uh, uh, state. And we have several ways to monitor the, the, the cardiac output in these patients. Uh, later, the, Dr. Balik will talk about this. But probably it's important to, mo to monitor the central venous saturation uh, because uh, usually it's low uh, in these patients and may uh, indicate how it's responding to the therapy. These are uh, different ways to uh, monitor cardiac output, uh, thermodilution, uh, CO2 rebreathing, uh, arterial pressure trace uh, estimation, uh, bioimpedance, but uh, probably it's quite important uh, to use the echocardiogram. And we can measure uh, in, indirectly the, car the cardiac output by uh, measuring the velocity time integral uh, in, 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 in the four chambers view, uh, usually. And this is, uh, there is a close correlation with cardiac output, also to measure left ventricular ejection fraction. But also we can uh, estimate the filling pressures uh, just with uh, uh, EA velocities of the, of the mitral uh, inflow. And also the tissue Doppler, we can measure uh, the same, the EA uh, velocities. And the integration between EA ratio or E E, e, e prime uh, ratio are very close correlation with uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. The patient was operated and was successfully operated, but uh, in the post-operative phase, uh, there, there were problems in extubating because uh, when we ventilate a patient, the, the main goal will be to uh, stop ventilation as soon as possible, and, and the patient. Uh, uh, was uh, was ready to to win uh, was considered ready to win and uh, we performed uh, the spontaneous breathing trial this is a trial of 30 minutes and then the to see what happens if the, the patient can be extubated is a successful uh, winning but sometimes <coughs> we can see a difficult winning when we need up to three times uh, or attempts to 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 of a spontaneous breathing trial to extubate the patient or, or more than seven days. But there also there are some patients who have a prolonged weaning with more than three times and more than seven days. And patients who, who fail the spontaneous breathing trial, many of them uh, adopt this uh, rapid shallow breathing pattern with um, a low tidal volume. Uh, this, is, this was during mechanical ventilation. This is a normal subject, and this is uh, the low tidal volume, this, with a lot of uh, effort and increasing pulmonary arterial pressure. And in this scenario, the, when, when we lose the positive pressure ventilation and the patient <coughs> breathes spontaneous, spontaneously, acute heart failure may occur. And which are the reasons? Probably the loss of the protective effect of uh, positive pressure, the negative intrathoracic pressure by, by the uh, inspiratory drive, uh, the increase in left ventricular preload and afterload, tachycardia, hypertension, and increasing cardiac consumption, which may produce ischemia. All of these may produce acute heart failure during winning. And heart, acute heart failure is responsible for nearly 40% of the spontaneous breathing trial failures in the ICU, but probably is higher in the CICU because there are more patients with cardiac problems. And this is the third question 
Which of the following may not be specifically related to winning failure due to heart failure during a spontaneous breathing trial? Increase in plasma protein level, baseline and uh, delta peptide levels, uh, significant decrease in EA or EE prime uh, ratios, low, love, uh, low uh, left ventricular ejection fraction and ele elevated uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or positive cumulative fluid balance in the, in the days before. Okay, great. We still have another 35 seconds to vote. And, and actually, I think the, the scenario highlights how important it is really to monitor and to keep in mind the heart-lung interaction. Because before, the patient was unstable from a respiratory point of view, but also from an hemodynamic point of view. And maybe adding too much PEEP could have been deleterious. But now in this case, we are actually, the patient was ventilated. We think it's getting better. And now we want to, we want to extubate. And sometimes we know that they go into respiratory failure because we actually we remove the protective effect of the ventilation so so let's see what is the answer here we have another three seconds and this is how our colleagues have answered so uh, uh, it's 36 percent an increase in plasma protein level uh, 21 percent a significant decrease in the AA and EE first ratios and 21% uh, low left ventricular ejection fraction and elevated capillary wedge pressures, and then the rest is, is the other. So what's your comment on this? Uh, uh, it's evident that uh, the patient has a low wedge ejection fraction and elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is, uh, is, is, is related specifically with this complication. Uh, positive cumulative balance we will see later in, in one slide. And also, the, 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 all the others are going to comment in, in next slides. There is a close uh, correlation between the EA uh, and EE prime uh, with the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And then uh, what we see is when the patient uh, has acute heart failure, an increase in EA ratio because it uh, increases the E velocity and also um, an, in, an increase in the E prime ratio because E prime uh, also diminishes and increases uh, e, e. And, and all, all both uh, uh, measurements are uh, indicative of uh, uh, acute heart failure. And also BNP may be useful, uh, baseline BNP and also changes in, in BNP during the spontaneous within trial and also has been uh, demonstrated that uh, patients who present a positive uh, previous balance, cumulative balance, have, uh, have more probability to fail the spontaneous breathing trial. And also uh, there is a, has been published that uh, an increase in plasma protein concentration may be also uh, a, 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 an indica indication of the patient has, uh, could be uh, heart failure, the, the cause of the winning failure. And then in conclusion, regarding non-invasive ventilation, the use of non-invasive ventilation in acute uh, pulmonary edema has increased in the last 20 years, and this is the second indication. Uh, is a, uh, are safe modalities that improve respiratory distress faster than conventional therapy. There's no doubt about this. And should be considered in all patients with significant respiratory failure and acute pulmonary edema. Both techniques de diminish the intubation rate and may reduce hospital mortality, particularly CPAP in high-risk patients with acute coronary syndromes. Non-invasive ventilation, primarily CPAP, uh, should be used early, preferably in the pre-hospital setting in the ambulance. Uh, Non-invasive ventilation or pressure support may be considered in most severe patients with hypercamnia. Expertise and adequate equipment are required in this case. According to the response, FiO2 may be increased up to 100%, but hyperoxia should be avoided. We didn't comment about hyperoxia, but uh, it is important. And mild sedation may improve adaptation in some cases. Uh, the response to NIV should be uh, assessed periodically at the first hours. This is uh, the standard for all kinds of non-invasive ventilation. And also positive intrathoracic pressure may increase cardiac output in some patients with heart failure. Some patients with cardiogenic shock may be treated with non-invasive ventilation, just few, but it is possible. Patients with cardiogenic shock should be closely monitored. Uh, cardiac output and feeling pressure are very important. Acute heart failure is a frequent complication during winning, especially in the in CICUs. Echocardiography, uh, especially the, 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 to see the low, uh, low ejection fraction, the e, I, e prime and the EA ratio or elevated e, uh, deceleration time, changes in natriuretic peptides, plasma protein levels are useful for monitoring and diagnosing the acute heart failure during winning. 
And finally, negative fluid balance, diuretics, and vasodilators are indicated in this setting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation and for giving a few take-home messages about this. Uh, we keep receiving quite a lot of questions from, uh, from home, uh, and we're going to answer this later, and please carry on. Uh, and as I said before, whatever we are not able to answer at the end of this session, we will do later on on the website. So without losing time, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Professor Martin Balik from Prague, who is going to talk a bit more about monitoring and a bit more also about the right side and the ventilation. Martin. Uh, good evening. My task is to focus on a right heart. And I would like to start with uh, the pathophysiology, what happens when the circulation is exposed to the unphysiologic positive pressure during inspiration. We know from available animal and patient data that the major determinant of increased RV outflow impedance and pulmonary vascular resistance is the uh, overinflation and the tidal volume. And if we set the ventilator in an aggressive mode, the aggressive IPPV may contribute to the decrease of the RV systolic function and dilatation of the right ventricle. And the permanent increase in pulmonary vascular resistance may lead to acute corporal monale which means that the dilatation is accompanied by paradoxic septal motion here, typically at the end of diastole, so that the uh, left ventricle takes the shape of a letter D, and uh, this is diagnostic for the acute corporal monale. Uh, at the same time, you see the increase in the diameter of the, of the major veins that can be also taken by echocardiography. You see the increase of the venous pressure, and uh, it goes hand in hand with the decrease of the left ventricular preload. And so with every inspiration, you can see the decrease of stroke volume and cardiac output, which is uh, interpreted as a D down effect and a process paradoxus. And it could be a false positivity for someone to give load, uh, lo uh, to give a volume load. That means the patient can be falsely indicated to be volume expanded. Another measure of uh, uh, this, uh, I would say, interaction between uh, heart and, and ventilation could be uh, the tissue Doppler of the tricuspid ring and the systolic wave, the STA, with the quite a high cutoff of 15 centimeters per second. And if you go below, you can uh, discriminate non-responders to fluid. So for example, in this patient with the reduced STA to seven centimeters per second, you would expect that you could see there's a dilated right heart uh, a delta down effect and a false indication that the patient could be volume responsive. We know from a large data set on mechanically ventilated patients with ARDS that uh, if we reduce the plateau pressure below 30 or maybe better below 28 or below 27, we can substantially reduce the incidence of acute corporal monale down to 33 and if we are below 27, down to 13, which applies to patients on IPPV. And we know from already uh, rather aged papers that the survival on IPPV, particularly in patients in ARDS, is related to the ejection fraction of the right ventricle. Uh, the right heart and the right ventricle is at risk, particularly in an attempt to recruit the collapsed lung. And the lung recruitment maneuver can result in a deformation and a change of the eccentricity index of the left ventricle. So the left ventricle uh, gets a diastolic problem and may uh, uh, fail in diastole by uh, actually uh, producing uh, significantly reduced stroke volume and cardiac output. And this paper again shows that with every inspiration, the end diastolic area of the left ventricle decreases with the increase of the dilatation and the end diastolic area on the right side. Uh, already Professor Cecconi mentioned the effect of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which somehow compensates for the uh, changes between the less hypoxic part of the pulmonary vascular bed and the less affected part because the disease is not always homogeneous. And we can somehow manipulate with this pulmonary uh, vasoconstriction uh, to improve the gas exchange and manipulate with the RV afterload. The systemic drugs that were tested, like vasoconstrictors or vasodilators, uh, hasn't been in use in intensive care because they always have a deleterious impact on the RV afterload or systemic hypotension. What we can use is the inhaled uh, vasodilators like prostacycline or nitric oxide. 
and this uh, we used quite a lot in the past, particularly in the 90s. Uh, when inhaling nitric oxide or prostacycline, you get with nitric oxide quite a swift improvement, or you may, may get a swift improvement, particularly in secondary ARDS, with oxygenation and gas exchange. With prostacycline, it could be somehow later. But the current evidence is that this method uh, and these methods of inha inhaled vasodilators lack an uh, uh, impact in, on mortality and long-term long morbidity. There's also a cost issue with current supply of nitric oxide. So if we think about the protection of right ventricle on IPPV, we should limit the plateau pressures to avoid trauma to a pulmonary vascular bed. We should probably switch a patient as soon as possible to some modalities with spontaneous breathing activity. We should evacuate significant pleural effusions and, of course, any pneumothorax, this is medical emergency on positive pressure ventilation. We must have a standby bronchoscope at 24 hours a day, and an intensivist should always aim to open any atelectasis uh, and uh, care about the airway. Uh, the setting of ventilation should uh, also respond to an issue of hypercarbia because this increases the right ventricular afterload as well. You should prone your patient early because there's not only a uh, ventilation and oxygenation indication to proning, but also a right ventricular problem. And patient with the right ventricular decompensation can uh, actually uh, be helped with early proning. Uh, that means that you turn your patient into the prone position and you wait for the effects, which could be uh, hemodynamic as well as respiratory. You should titrate very judiciously the preload in a right ventricular uh, problem, and you can reduce the dose of vasopressors like noradrenaline by using vasopressin. Last not least, you can use denebulized vasodilators like prostacycline or nitric oxide. I would like to turn your attention also to contribution of lung ultrasonography, because if you use it as part of your echo assessment, a hemodynamic assessment in a systematic manner, that means that you, for example, scan for, uh, that you scan for uh, 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 six region on the right and six regions on the left side, and you classify the degree of, for example, uh, degree of alveolar interstitial syndrome, you can, uh, you can differentiate four degrees of lung consolidation. Uh, this is the first degree where uh, you see lung sliding, a sliding of periatlon visceral pleura here with one command at the A-line, which suggests that the lung is well aerated and the degree of uh, uh, actually uh, inflammation and water in the interstitial tissue and interlobular tissue is low. Uh, the, uh, seeing uh, Z-lines like this is also acceptable. They do not interfere with the A-lines. So this is all a grade one. Grade two means that there are multiplied comets and they are in a distance up to four to seven millimeters from each other. Grade three, you get a coalescent B-lines, which are very dense, and grade four is an overt consolidation. Here you see a consolidation of a patient with a uh, 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 significant uh, 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 pneumonia, and you see the dynamic bronchogram here with every inspiration the air gets into the segmental level of the bronchial tree. The practical <coughs> application of this B line versus A line pattern can be seen on this paper because the B lines correlate somehow with the extravascular lung water. And if we see a predominant A line, we can be certain that the left atrial pressure or the pulmonary uh, artery occlusion pressure would be somewhere below 18. And if we see a predominant uh, uh, B line, we can be uh, certain that uh, that would be probably somewhere uh, uh, above, above 13. The between 13 and 18 is a bit of uncertainty. And I suggest everyone to use echocardiography to uh, complete these data together. However, in ventilated patients, they give you certain limit of safety because not in every ventilated patient you can do a, a superb echocardiogram. Uh, this paper is uh, interesting in terms of uh, stratifying patients uh, in terms of lung recruitment using the lung recruitment score, which is based exactly on these four degrees of lung consolidations.
the auto titrated PEEP and ventilation setting uh, in patients with ARDS from, pe from PEEP of 15 down to PEEP of zero. And what they found is that the uh, lung uh, consolidation and the, the uh, lung ultrasound score correlated with the PV tool taken from the respiratory mechanics on the ventilator. For our purposes, what's important is that uh, it looks like that the grade four, particularly when found at the basal and caudal lung regions, is not recruitable. And in the upper region, very scarcely, you can somehow open the consolidated lung to grade three. And so I'm giving you an example of a patient with the hospital-associated pneumonia with some aspiration on the top, which has been intubated at night. And you have him on an ongoing volume expansion being taken to the ICU with the FiO2 of 100% on people 14 with the respiratory tidal volume 7 mL per kilo. And this picture is taken here at the right lower lobe. You see the dynamic bronchogram after the patient was uh, actually uh, treated, I would say treated with the bronchoscopy, which opened the airway and took the specimen for microbiology. And you see a, a profound stroke volume variation in the left ventricular outflow tract. So this is non-homogeneous unilateral disease with a C-type fourth degree consolidation, even dorsal, and there's a significant heart-lung interaction. When we look to the pericardium, because we have to assess the hemodynamics in a patient in septic shock, we see a dilated right ventricle with paradoxic septal motion. We see a reduced tricuspid annual displacement or tricuspid annual systolic excursion, which is around 15 millimeters, a dilated lower vena cava, and there's a gradient taken on the tricuspid valve, which is around 40 millimeters of mercury, suggesting this patient has got a moderate pulmonary hypertension. And my question to the attendees is, how would you interpret the strong volume variation? Okay, great. So we have a few options there to interpret. So we have hypovolemia, left ventricular failure, there is a delta up effect, there is an effect of the right ventricular afterload, or is it just the impact of a very aggressive uh, intrapositive uh, pressure? Or is it just because we have right ventricular failure with hypocontractility? And I think this is a very, very interesting case. We have another 45 seconds to, to vote. And, and this is interesting because often we get these patients and they are not just hypoxic, they are also hypotensive. And uh, we want to know what is the best strategy to optimize them hemodynamically. And often we have SVVs and PPVs that are high. And uh, you showed that there's two information, not just the SVV and the, from the monitor, but also the echo. So I suspect putting this together, the, we should be able to get an answer. But I'm curious to see what is uh, your answer there. So we have another 10 seconds uh, to vote. Uh, and then we will be able to discuss what they've been able to, to answer at home. And we will see if you, if you agree or maybe if you disagree. So this is how we've answered from home. Um, you would interpret the SVV mainly 55% as right ventricular volume pressure, volume overload, so a delta down effect. And then we have a 20% that says just the impact of aggressive intrapositive pressure ventilation. And then right ventricular failure on 15%. And the rest is hypovolemia or left ventricular failure. So what's your view on this? I'm happy to see the correct answer is really three. That yeah. is the 55% because this is clearly a right ventricular overload by uh, probably a combination of aggressive mode of ventilation plus uh, some volume which was given initially in a fast manner. And uh, 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 then probably there could be also an option that the aggressive IPPV modality has an impact, but this is not per se as we see. And I think a very problem. important comment there, clearly this shows the role of the echo in this patient. Yeah. But if we haven't done an echo and we were just trying to give fluids but on the base of an SVV, I would probably say always be aware of a cardiac output that does not increase when we give fluids on ISVV. It's a high suspicion of something else going on. And often in these cases, you have ventricular failure. So don't just carry on giving fluids because the SVV is not coming down. That patient probably needs an echo and needs to have an assessment of the right ventricular function. Yeah. And I have another tricky question. What would be the best lung opening strategy? It could be either 40 second lasting lung recruitment maneuver over 40 millibars of CPAP, then uh, open lung concept with the uh, looking for the lower inflection point on a PV tool, then 
The third option is left semi-prone position, spontaneously triggered modality with the pre plateau pressure below 28, then high frequency oscillation with the continuous distension pressure below 28, prone position and open lung concept. Okay, so we have a lot of options there. And again, this is a, a big dilemma because again, we have to remember these are, are real cases. We have a patient that is markedly hypoxic, is unstable hemodynamically. We need to try to reverse the hypoxia there and what's going to be our best strategy. And again, I think we need to have in our mind always the heart and the lungs together. I think if we fixate probably only in one, we always give the wrong answer. It's not the right answer just for one organ. I think it's the, the wrong answer for both. So we have another seven seconds to vote and then we'll be able to see what people have answered from home. So here we go. So we have 48% say that we should use prone positioning and open lung concept with peep titration according to pressure volume loops. And, and then we have a 20% and an 18% almost equally split. So open lung concept with a tidal volume of 6 millilitre per kilo and peep according to taking again from uh, pressure volume loops, or 17% uh, left semi-prone position, spontaneously trigger modality with plateau pressure less than 28. So what I'm, have you done in this case? I'm within the 17% because the imaging tells you the distribution of the lung disease. Uh, that is, we turned the patient semi-prone and we did the bronchoscopies on a patient and physio, and you see after 36 hours it looks like this. And you see the lung ultrasonography looks like this. This is the C-type consolidation with the dynamic bronchogram. And here you see after 36 hours, the lung is somehow at grade 3. Maybe above the bottom would be at grade 2. So, and the other therapy, the patient was in septic shock. It was Klebsiella pneumonia and hemocultures. Uh, we stopped the infusions initially, but then with the septic shock, we had to continue, of course. And the patient was treated on BiPAP with this setting initially, and after 36 hours he was turned to PSV and extubated after 48 hours. You see the dosages of catecholamines. I would like to touch at the end the monitoring, and I must say that to assess the heart-lung interactions, the echo is something which you have to do, and this is simply a must in intensive care these days, particularly in patients like this one. And I wouldn't like to go into detail to, to go through all the modalities that can be taken by ECHO, and I, I'm sure that the attendees are aware of it. The only discussed issue is that with ECHO, you set your hemodynamic goals, then you treat the patient and you reassess, and you just see what happened. And if, the issue is that the ECHO is uh, told to be intermittent. These days, we have available devices which can guarantee at least 72 hours of continuous 2D and chiral Doppler scanning through uh, using a thin transesophageal probe. While we have an array of the continuous methods, with the continuous methods, uh, you can have the pulse control analysis, you can have transpulmonary dilution. We still use the PA line, and particularly for the right ventricular failure, uh, for the benefit of continuous monitoring of pulmonary artery pressure. This is very useful in patients with a severe uh, pulmonary hypertension, like right, thromboembolic disease or, or mitral valve disease, or patients who have a <coughs> right ventricular failure on aggressive mode of ventilation. There is also a cost issue, and I would like to stress that these, these continuous methods are somehow calibrated by echocardiography, because you set your goals from echocardiography, and then you set the goals for the nurses who look after the continuous monitoring with the, with the continuous methods. Of course, you work as a team, but the calibration of continuous methods by echocardiography is something very important. And uh, my conclusion, if you look at the heart-lung interactions at the bedside, uh, to correctly interpret, you should know the LV status, as perfectly described by pre the previous speaker. And uh, you should uh, uh, think about the right ventricular status. You should know uh, uh, how uh, is the pericardium reserve volume because you know the pathophysiology. When you lose it in a tamponade or constriction, you get a significant heart-lung interaction as opposed to paradoxus. You should know your ventilator setting because with low tidal volumes, you can have uh, a less heart-lung interaction than with the big ones. If you have a, a, a rapid uh, respiratory rate, you lose your heart-lung interactions on the left heart while your collapsibility indexes on the right side can still be preserved. You can change your cutoffs for PPV and SVV in patients with low 
uh, lung compliance or in patients with the increase of intraabdominal pressure. And if you have someone who changes the tidal volume or has a variable rhythm, then you need some dynamic maneuvers like passive leg rising or and expiratory occlusion test. So in general, when looking at the monitor, you should have some uh, knowledge of the TTET exam in a patient who is very unstable and you should know the ventilator setting. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. It was great. And again, we had some more knowledge and more insight on heart lung uh, interaction, a bit more on the right ventricle. We touched on the left ventricle before. We, we have a lot of questions, so I think we will proceed with some, and uh, I suspect we will not have time to answer all, all of them. But I think the first question, which is an interesting question here, is, the, is there a role for prone uh, positioning in cardiac ICU patients, I assume, without ARDS? Um, I think this is very ex exceptional because uh, we we have used prone position just in two or three times, uh, and and uh, were patients that we didn't know if they were uh, cardiac or not uh, cardiac origin. And often, sometimes we have. A Type yeah. of shock that are actually coexisting on the shock, same yes. patient. And, and what we saw in, in, in those cases, uh, in, in, in three cases, that the patients recovered very, very fast, and we we could realize that was a cardiac origin, the respiratory yeah. distress. But uh, I think it's exceptional because, yeah. and, uh, and I don't think we can probably say that there is evidence to suggest that in respiratory yes, because, failure of pure cardiac. Origin. Yes, because cardiac patients uh, or left ventricular failure patients do not uh, die for the respiratory uh, failure. Usually, they die because of uh, uh, cardiac failure for for the damage of the myocardium. Okay. Do you want to comment on, on that as well? well? We use a prone position uh, probably more often in general ICU. And <clears throat> the attendees should know that the indication to prone position is not only uh, a, resp a respiratory problem, that is the hypoxia, or not a, it's not a rescue modality, it should be applied uh, much earlier than it's, than it's applied uh, worldwide. It's a very handy method and, and very cheap and very effective in certain cases. So it's not only respiratory or a ventilation problem, but it's also a hemodynamic indication, and that is the right ventricular uh, 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 overload and a right ventricular um, uh, problem with the afterload particularly because by proning you somehow um, improve the pulmonary vascular bed. Okay, so another question is what is the best ventilatory mode for patients that are very unstable from an hemodynamic point of view? Um, it's a very vague question. Um, uh, you can give the a best very mode answer. is the is the safest one. <laughs> so, uh, if you have a hemodynamically unstable patient, and if it's a cardiac patient, there's one issue I would like to answer, and that is changing uh, pulmonary compliance, because if you imp if you indicate a positive pressure ventilation, which may somehow improve the stroke volume and may reduce the left ventricular afterload and may help left ventricle in performance then uh, with your treatment, the left ventricle should probably improve. And then the lung compliance should improve as well. And if you go for pressure uh, uh, control ventilation, you can cause overinflation a couple of hours later. So you must either cautiously set your alarms, or I would really vote for a, a volume uh, a controlled SIMV or volume controlled uh, ven ventilatory mode. I suspect we have very different views here. Probably yeah. many people will use uh, different strategies. What would be your preference, your uh, mode of ventilation? We, we were uh, reviewing this issue recently, and, and in fact, uh, you can get the same results with uh, pressure control or volume control, just uh, moving the, the flow and, 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 and the pressures. And the, 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 in fact, there is no differences. Uh, had, had not been the but most probably what we can say is whatever ventilation strategy you want to use, you have to remember to try to be gentle with the lungs and uh, probably don't just maximize the short-term goal to try to get uh, the oxygenation as high as you can because if we ventilate with very high tidal volume, we know that that has got consequences later on down the road for, for these patients. So um, another question is uh, about... Uh, Asthma patients or patients with uh, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, is there a role for these patients when they come to our units 
uh, also to beta block them or is the complete contradiction there if they are really, really fast? In fact, uh, in asthma patients, uh, we never use uh, beta blockers. But in COPD patients, uh, we, we can use if they are not very, uh, they have a, um, a uh, bronchoconstriction. In, in these cases, uh, uh, we can use if, uh, if, if there is an indication, if the patient has uh, ischemia or something like this. Uh, but if there is a, a clear hyperreactivity of the of the bronchi, uh, we, we avoid to use uh, beta blockers. Okay. Mm. And do you want to make a comment about patients that come with uh, normal, uh, as an hypoxic patient that, for instance, is on home oxygen and now is developing uh, acute heart failure, so is also on pulmonary edema? What is your target? Is it a target, again, of a saturation of 100% or is it a, a lower target for this patient in the acute phase maybe and in the, you know, a bit later on when the patient is stabilized? Uh, uh, we, we try to know which is the, the, the normal, the, the regular uh, uh, gases that of these patients uh, and we try to move uh, within these uh, intervals. But anyway, uh, now we are very aware to avoid hyperoxygenation because we, we, we see that uh, uh, when we see that the patient has a pulse, uh, pulse oximeter, 100% may, may, may be uh, with uh, 200 millimeters of mercury. And this is uh, maybe deleterious. This decreases the coronary blood flow and the coronary resistances. And for this reason, we always avoid uh, um, hyperoxemia. Uh, this, then the, 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 the answer would be uh, we, are, we are not uh, following uh, the target of 100% uh, because 100% uh, may be dangerous and we, we try to adapt uh, the ventilator to, to which, which are the regular... Uh, and, and I think that's a very important message, not to give too much of FiO2 when we ventilate, no. uh, ventilate our patient. But on the other hand, on the acute setting, maybe I would still tolerate to go a bit higher than 88 or 92%, which I tolerate if it is just a, an obstructive crisis rather than if it is a, an acute cardiac uh, crisis. But, but in, 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 in another uh, way, is when, when the patient has a pulmonary edema and remain hypoxemic with a high FiO2, we don't doubt to, to increase FiO2 to 100%. Uh, and, and this is uh, sometimes uh, it's, it's useful uh, even uh, without non-invasive ventilation in patients that they are nearly to, to be intubated. Okay. Martin, inotropic agent and ventilator settings. We have a patient that is in cardiogenic shock and we think that the output is not adequate there. Where do you work first if it is a right ventricular failure? Do you try to titrate down the PIP? Do you decide to add an inotrope at some point? What is your approach? Well, first of all, um, I would probably uh, assess the hemodynamics with echo and, and see if the patient uh, needs a possible relief in, on a, on a uh, pulmonary vascular resistance side, that means the setting of the ventilator. Uh, uh, concerning the right ventricle and the right heart, first issue, absolutely critical issue, is the preload. So I have to assess the contractility at least by simple measures, by uh, looking at the tricuspid ring and the free ventricular wall, uh, to see the collapsibility of the venous system, use some dynamic maneuver like uh, passive leg rising or anti-expiratory occlusion test. I would like to definitely initially assess the pulmonary artery pressure and try to titrate the ventilation and all the things around, which I mentioned in, in a presentation that is possible elimination of fluidotheresis or atelectasis and, and other things. I would Definitely think about proning patient earlier than the other cases because of the right ventricular failure. And then I would get to the inotropes. Uh, according to the expert opinion, I would always try to keep the neuroadrenaline less than 0.5 microgram per kilo per minute. I could eventually use uh, agents like the butamine. Uh, we don't have a dopexamine available, but I can have levosimendon in a critical cases. And uh, we should also consider the uh, inhaled vasodilators. Fantastic. Well, thank you both. I think our time has run over and thank you everyone for following us. We had lots of questions. We will answer later on. You will find the answers on the website. I I'm going to conclude. I really enjoyed this uh, webinar. I we had two great presentations and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Just some take-home messages really. I think we learned today the role of non-invasive ventilation in pulmonary edema.
that is really important to monitor both the respiratory function and the cardiac function, and there is really an increased role for echocardiography and hemodynamic monitoring. Let's use protective lung strategy in the majority of our patients when we're ventilating them. Let's remember that we want to recruit to reduce the hypoxia there, but we have to remember that the right ventricle is always there and we don't have to make any damage. And let's remember heart-lung interaction. Every time we do maneuvers, whether it is an hemodynamic maneuver, it is a ventilator maneuver in, in our patient is really, really, really important. And uh, sometimes even when our patients get stable, when they fail in extubation, is not necessarily a respiratory problem. Again, it could be that maybe they were needed a bit more support on the ventilator. Thank you very much.